Welcome in, Iowa Hawkeye fans, to another week of the Hawkeye Tailgate Report. I'm Luke Myers. We got Joey Myers, Austin Myers, and Sam Middleton. Uh, a lot of low energy from me this week. It was just an absolutely brutal weekend for me with the Twins getting swept by the Yankees and the Hawkeyes losing to Michigan in the way they did. Boys, how are you doing? Uh, a lot better than you, Bob. Yeah, You should I, uh, I, turn that frown upside down or let one of us uh, headline because yikes. Yeah, that was a pretty uh, low energy uh, intro. I I'll promise that I'll bring more en- energy to the podcast tonight than you just did in that intro, Luke. Well, I I can yeah. pro- I can promise you that this is a hundred percent authentic. I am fairly depressed and deflated right now. I mean, the Twins made the playoffs. The Viking okay, the Vikings kind of suck, but the Hawkeyes are still good. So you'll yeah. be all right, buddy. Huh. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Luke, I, I texted you this today, but I'll just reiterate it for all of our avid listeners. I don't feel that bad for you in your sports fandom right now because the Hawkeyes lost, and then the Steelers lost, so my football teams got swept by the Harbaugh brothers this weekend. Ooh. And then the Steelers are also going to be starting a third-string quarterback this week, and the Cubs missed the playoffs. So sports aren't exactly going my way right now Who, either. Who's but it's a new week. We're going to get over it. Who's the Steelers quarterback this week? Devlin Hodges. Yikes. Okay. Oh, is he undrafted, dude? Yeah. Austin's QB <laughs> almost uh, lost his life. He's the FCS all-time career leader in passing yards. He goes by Duck. No, that's not great. Okay, that's jo- not a good nickname yeah. for a quarterback. <laughs> All right, Joey, yeah. how are you feeling, the other resident Twins fan? Pretty tired. Um, Vikings are keeping me afloat right now, though. So, And the new basketball jerseys just got released minutes ago. For Wait, Iowa, what? so yeah, they just released a teaser video. They look pretty sick, so that we got that going for us right now too. All right, so nice. we're gonna talk about the Michigan game, uh, some topics from there, uh, talk about if the defense can hang with Big Ten elites, and favorite Penn State memory, thoughts from space, and Joey's Urban Dictionary read. But we'll get right to this Michigan game. There was, I honestly had zero doubt in that game that we were going to lose out after the first five minutes were over. I was so confident because our defense looked so good, but offense play gone wasn't great. The worst offensive line play I have ever seen from any team in my life in that game. Stanley didn't look good. Where do you want to start with this one? Let's start with the O line. Um, we have been rotating in so many guys in and out, like to get just to see who the five should be. And that definitely hurt us against Michigan. Like, I don't know why the coaches are so high on and or if he listens, I'm sorry, Cole, you're probably awesome. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> he literally, I watched him get beat like four times or he didn't, he would double down and not go get the guy he's supposed to get. And there would just be a free rusher right through his, Incredibly infuriating. I think I think uh, Mark Kallenberger should be out there, even though he's a tackle. But we got to get our best um, five out there. Additionally, I think Alaric Jackson looked like a deer in headlights out there on Saturday. And I Kirk said as much. He said it was pretty much his fault that he played him as much as he did in his first game back. And uh, yeah, that that was not pretty either. Yeah, I mean, obviously we want to have our best players out there, and he's a future first round draft pick at the offensive line when he's at his best. But when you're playing in a hostile road environment like that, you can't be throwing somebody out there who hasn't played in a snap in three plus weeks, four plus weeks. And then also um, just, he probably wasn't a hundred percent coming back from injury. I think that it might've been a mistake to give him the amount of time uh, that they did. Well, and it was- which is weird considering how like, cautious our guy our coaches are with bringing guys back like julius brents is like he played maybe i don't even know did he play on saturday special teams i don't but think like so. special but alaric jackson just right in the mix like what well and mm-hmm. like jackson didn't play great but he still played better than our interior linemen like they were J- michigan was just blowing stunts up the middle and just blowing by our defensive linemen. And they weren't even, I mean, yeah, they brought pressure a lot, but, like, e- there would be plays where they'd rush four against five, and they would have no problem get to Stanley. And, yeah, Stanley played bad, but it's hard to be comf- uh, comfortable in the pocket if you have literally 
a second and a half. Like you run a play action play, turn around, and there's a defender there right in your face. Like that's well, that's the problem. It, like our play actions weren't like straight play action. It was like the play action that he tries to sell. And then mm-hmm. by the time he turns around, they're right there, and they're like long <laughs> routes developing. Like that's totally on Brian Ferentz for he need, the quick slants were open all game long, and I don't know why we didn't just dink and dunk our way down the field like Northwestern does to us every year. Just blows my mind. Yeah, we should have. Yeah, just... I think that. Yeah, you Oops, go awesome. Go ahead. All right. Okay. Uh, so they should have just <laughs> they should have just kept running slants with. Tracy and Marset because those two are lightning when they have the football and there's really no I mean the game plan called for that you quickly found out after the first even the first quarter of play that that was going to be the play that won us the game giving those two the ball as as soon as possible and giving Goodson the ball on open field those were the three best options we had and we really didn't utilize them well enough yeah I think that the poor offensive line play was also just a byproduct of uh, the play calling in general. So it, like, obviously the line did not play up to their expectations or anybody's expectations for my offensive line, but I think the play calling uh, certainly didn't help that situation either. And I, uh, one of them actually alluded to that. I think it was uh, Levi Paulson after the game, you know, you know, post game interviews, he was talking. Um, and I don't remember the quote exactly, but it was basically along the lines of he said that, uh, the off the line was kind of surprised by some of the play calls and he didn't think that they set them up for success in a lot of situations. <laughs> I read that quote and immediately thought that guy is not starting next. Week. Yeah. I was like, what a ballsy thing for him to say. Like mm-hmm. I agree completely. And it was, it was honestly, he was right. But like, Oh man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, I like how you see it. I appreciate he it. He must but... have some serious blackmail on Brian fair. <laughs> <laughs> And also, the running backs didn't provide much resistance either. I remember a few plays where Sargent just got blown by or just whiffed on a block and on ones on ones right up the middle, and that was that was tough to watch as well. Speaking of the running backs, why? And we gave up on the run game so fast, way early, way too. It was a seven point game, and we were getting five yards, like four to five yards of carry half the time. I don't know. We got away from our tendencies, and it well. Yeah, how many? Ferentz, I, Ferentz needs to prove he can call a game in a, in a big, in a, in a tough environment. Is what he needs like, to happen. How many? I don't know if I can remember an Iowa game in the past where it's always, even if it's not working, we run the ball until the defense breaks down and we explode for a huge play. And we never had that. We we like you said, we abandoned it so early. We never wore him down at all. And I mm-hmm. I don't know. Well, and another thing about the offensive line that what was it the second final drive we had there before the ugly final drive never really stood a chance where we got the ball across midfield and then what was it three holding penalties and an illegal wide receiver downfield or an uneligible uh lineman downfield that that was first yeah we we had first and 10 at michigan's 25 and then we went to first and 30 from the 45 and two, cause it was two consecutive holding penalties, and then it was an ineligible receiver downfield. And that's what happened all day long to an offense. We had, like, uh, I think it was either six or eight drives, which we got into Michigan's territory and failed to score points on. You're not going to win any big games on the road when as soon as you get into opponent's territory, you start going negative. Because that's exactly what happened. It was... We would get into Michigan's side of the field, and then it would be penalties, or it would be sacks, or negative run plays. It was just every time that we got into a position where we could, you know, threaten to score, build some momentum, we just completely dropped the ball. And yep. And that's just like completely uncharacteristic of Iowa. Like in the past, Iowa's been known for not making mental mistakes and playing their brand of football, but we made an ass load of mental mistakes and didn't play our brand of football. And we we have a good record in recent history against Michigan, and basically all of those games were won doing Iowa's brand of football. So I don't know what made Iowa a jump ship, but it just we just, w- we just didn't play clean. Yeah, mm-hmm. I and think did what we can't afford to do and, and beat ourselves. Also, shout out to Fox for really jinxing the crap out of stanley before the game and basically the whole iowa team by saying oh stanley hasn't thrown an interception yet this year 
goes out there and throws three interceptions, and on the first play of the game, we fumble on a run. So, shout out to Fox yeah, for that. Yeah, that was not great. Yeah. Um, I think if there's any one stat from the entire game that it just goes to show that Iowa did not play like themselves and were basically about as far away from their identity as possible would be that Iowa ended the game with one total rushing yard. And I understand that uh, sacks take into account there, so those are considered negative rushing yards. But that's not really an excuse because Iowa is supposed to be built on the strength of their offensive line. And if you're telling me for a 60-minute football game they're going to end with one yard rushing, I that's just unexcusable from an Iowa team. That just goes to show how far outside of their identity they were playing in that game. Yeah, uh, you you want to touch on the running back situation here a little bit because if Tyler Goods, Goodson isn't the lead back the rest of the season, there's something seriously wrong because he was easily yeah. the most explosive player on our offense. I, I read some things on the Hawkeye Report Lounge that just there was a thread, Tyler Goodson, and the first post was, this guy is the best back we have. And I was like, okay, I can get behind this. And then the replies were like, yeah, I don't see why everyone's saying Goodson's such, such a good back, yada, yada. I'm like, what? Are we watching the same football game? Mm-hmm. Like, the dude, when the ball is in his hands, is like, he is a threat. He's like Akram like, Wadley and DJK in one package. Like, he can make anybody miss in the open field. He has the speed away to run away from anybody. It's. Shout out, DJK. Shout out, DJK and Akram. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I saw that uh, the first. Uh, like depth chart that I will release for this week following the Michigan game. Goodson actually made his first depth chart of the season, but he's still listed as the third string running back instead of Ivory Kelly Martin now. Um, which, as long as he's getting the most touches, it doesn't really matter. I suppose so, but even still, we he needs to play more. And I know some people are going to say, and I, there was a couple times where he did miss on uh, picking up a blitzer in pass protection, and obviously that's more of a product of him being a true freshman starting on the road at Michigan and just inexperienced with the speed of the game at that level. But I mean, even with that negative aspect to his game, if he's not a great pass protector, his ability to run the ball and catch the ball far outweighs any of that negative, And he should be getting the most touches out of any of our backs. That first run that Torrin Young had to start the second half, it was like a 15 yarder. That was a touchdown if Goodson was carrying the ball. Yeah, that that was a huge hole on a cutback to the left side. It was yeah, Goodson was gone. He was beating that uh, secondary player to the punch there, and he he has incredible hands. Well, and the the biggest play Iowa had was that catch down the left sideline, and they I mean it was a beautiful ball by Stanley put right on the money, but Goodson did his part to beat the defenders in the secondary and lay out and get the football and put us in good field position, and I. It just get the guy the ball. It it's I trust Kirk, not rocket science. Yeah, I trust Kirk <laughs> Ferentz and I trust Brian Ferentz, but some of their play calling the other day was extremely questionable. From oh that jailbreak screen on third and ten, I literally about jumped through my TV. Yeah, that was nuts. Yeah. that was a hell of a play call, and that just shows what I like, get the ball in his hands. You know, that wasn't even to him. It that was, was to Smith Marseille. Yeah, to Smith Marseille. <laughs> I know, I'm saying no, the I'm... second jailbreak screen where oh, okay. it went for like one yard. I literally wanted to jump through my TV and like not celebrate, but like to be mad. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I don't know. The the whole situation with, uh, God, Goodson is confusing enough. I don't think, I think his role will still sit, stay very much the same throughout the rest of the season just because, you know, Kirk Ferentz likes to play as upperclassmen and respect their age and whatnot. But uh, another question. Uh, I like Nico Regani, but how come Smith Marset still doesn't return punts? Because if the more we can get the ball that in is, that guy's hands, it, it would be, just be great. That is the dumbest thing about the season to me is why Smith Marset does not return punts. Well, we've never seen he's... him return punts. We've seen I know it's, right. it's completely different than kickoff. It's completely different, though. He right, might not be comfortable back there. He's your hands down your biggest playmaker. You have you would think that you could figure something out to get him back there to catch punts. I think Oliver Martin should be back there, and I'm not just saying that because I want him on the field. I really think he's a difference maker with the ball in his hands. 
Well, uh, whatever. I just don't well, think Reganey's the answer there. Yeah, I don't know. Even if Smith Marset isn't the answer, just say throw him out there and give him the opportunity because you want the ball in your best playmaker's hands. Reganey is clearly not the answer. How many times this year has he? He fair- did have a nice return though when he did finally catch the ball. But wasn't okay. it called back for a holding or something? No. Okay, but. I mean, either way, how many times a season has he let a ball bounce when he should have fair caught it or fair caught it inside the 10 or not been able to cut off a ball or he just has not been good. And also, I don't know if it's still this way, but at least earlier in the season, you know, first couple of weeks, um, Smith Marset was listed as our number one punt returner on the depth chart. And then they kept sticking Reganey out there. So I don't understand that logic. I mean, if you want Reganey to be the guy, just list him as the number one and send him out there. But I don't know. I think that it, at least it, it can't hurt to give him a chance or give somebody else an opportunity because it's not working the way that it is. Well, you're in luck because next year it's going to be Deron McKinney. Uh, all right. No, that's not a mirror. So an- <laughs> another thing from this game. This surpassed the Penn State game from last year as Nate Stanley's worst game. Correct as a starter. No, that game was still worse. Oh, I don't yeah. know. Uh, he did. He was pretty bad in this game, but la- that that game last year, that Penn State game, was so bad last pretty year. Pretty sure he, he had, had like a negative thirty-five, like quarterback rating. Yeah. So, so what are we I'm, thinking here about Stanley confidence level wise? Because I'm the biggest Nate Stanley apologist there is, and just like in crunch time the other day, he would looked like he was on completely different pages with his wide receivers and he just didn't look comfortable at all and as a senior third year starter you'd think that hey I've played enough big road games in my time here at Iowa that I should be able to put the pressures aside a little bit and dictate what happens in this game and he just didn't look like that the thing is though I I love Stanley he's great but he doesn't have a signature win in his career yet. I mean, he's had opportunities the last three seasons to have an actual great win on his resume. At the road, on the road at Wisconsin, at the horrible game, on the road at Penn State, probably the worst game of his career, and then this week uh, on the road at Michigan, he played terrible. So he's had opportunities to put a signature win in his career at Iowa, and every time opportunity has presented itself he's fallen way short of the expectations that we've given him and it's it's not like we haven't seen him be able to be good but he just hasn't shown up in most of the opportunities was he not the qb when we beat ohio state yeah he was i was just thinking that he absolutely has a signature win on his resume i think he threw like three or four times but and mississippi was, state and mississippi state yeah so i mean he has wins no, but he's, iowa state. well iowa state if and Nebraska. Yeah. Uh, okay, Nebraska's yeah. a stretch. I know, I know what you're saying. I Nate Stanley frustrates the heck out of me, but, I mean, I don't want anybody else as the quarterback on the team. So, yeah. I, I actually like, had, I had somebody... T- uh, somebody he's a good quarterback. So. I had somebody tell me they want Petrus to be the quarterback. Like, no, what, in what situation? Absolutely, 100% no. Yeah, that no. is stupid. Like, he's he has a ton of experience. He's thrown a lot of touchdowns in his career. Like that cannot go like overlooked because he does have the arm talent to get it done, but he's just never shown up on the road really in big situations. Yeah, and I hate to say it, but he does kind of remind me of Kirk Cousins. The dude gets stats, he gets numbers, but when he comes into a big game, that's not where he gets his numbers. I mean, you got to at some point you have to get over that hump and you have to be able to perform at least decently on a consistent basis against good teams and uh, i don't know if he gets nervous or what but he's gonna shut y'all up in like i three days i, I hope so i, hope I so. encourage it I, think I, like- that, I, I think that he'll play well at home i think that the team will play significantly better at home against penn state i just like when we go on the road to wisconsin what nate stanley are we gonna get are we gonna get michigan nate stanley or are we gonna get ohio state nate stanley we're gonna and get I'm from Wisconsin, Nate Stanley. Thanks for not offering me. Here's my giant Nate Stanley D, eight touchdowns. Hopefully. That would make me the happiest guy in the world, but when he's at his best, he's very good. And when he's at his worst, like he was against Michigan, it's barely passable. 
Plus, Jonathan Taylor will have nine touchdowns. We'll still lose by seven. I still disagree <laughs> with that strongly. Like, we haven't talked about the defense really much yet, but that's because that was one of the best defensive performances I've ever seen put out by a coach parents team because we only – really, the defense only gave up seven points. I mean, Michigan scored ten, but that was because the fumble on the first possession and they just kicked home a cheap shot field goal. So, like, allowing seven points on Michigan's homecoming – that's a hell of a feat right there, and they could have easily rolled over after being down 10 nothing early and thinking, oh, my God, we're in deep shit now, but that wasn't the case at all. Phil Parker had his boys ready to play, and they looked really good in doing it. Are they building Phil's statue, like, now, or, like, when is that going <laughs> up? I think it's going to take a while. Yeah, he's got a little more work to do, but he's certainly a good coordinator we got here. Uh, but we we still control our own destiny in the Big Ten West. And I know all Iowa fans don't want to hear that because it's a ridiculous thing to stay that, say. That means we would have to beat Penn State and we would have to win at Wisconsin and not lose one of those games that we usually lose once a year to, like, Northwestern or Purdue. Purdue. <laughs> hey, we also got to beat undefeated Minnesota. Oh, don't, don't get me started. They are I'm pretty Minnesota. sure us four could beat Minnesota. <laughs> I, I think Minnesota's average margin of victory is like two and a half points. It's pretty pathetic. Yeah, they're like considering... to, they're like plus or minus yards against opposition is like plus forty five or something like Yikes. that. And like uh, before this past weekend where they beat Illinois, congratulations Minnesota. They uh, they've played garbage teams and they're they hadn't won a game by more than seven. So it like. Uh, when we were in Minneapolis on Monday, talk talk radio up there was like, oh, this Minnesota team, they could run the table and we, we could get something done. No, you're going to get rolled by Iowa and Wisconsin. So, like, it's going to be fun to see them melt down here shortly and P.J. Fleck lose his mind. But, yeah, Minnesota is not good. You know, you know though, I'll, I'll let them have their fun because that reminds me of a, lo- a lot of a certain Iowa team Yeah, not so long ago. That yeah. Iowa team. Uh, no, no, uh, our team was our team was obviously better, but I mean, we didn't have much of a schedule. They don't have much right. of a schedule, so it, it'd yeah. be it'd be somewhat hypocritical of us to give them too too rough of a time. That Iowa yeah, team I'm, I'm, had three NFL, at least three NFL players on their roster. So more than that, way more than that. Well, I'm saying they also like we didn't almost lose to like every team we played. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like we beat I, North Texas sixty three to, to sixteen. Sorry, Austin, go. Like for reference, Minnesota would have beaten North Texas forty four to thirty five. You know, I'm not trying to say that Minnesota is good because they're not, but I can understand where like their fan base or their sports radio might be coming from. And like, it's not that hard to look at their schedule this year and then look at what Iowa did in 2015 and be like, it's not that dissimilar. I mean, you you can only play the people that you're scheduled against. And at the end of the day, if you win the game, that's all that matters. You don't have to win pretty. I'm not saying that Minnesota is good, but I can understand where some of their fans could be like, Hey, you know what? We haven't lost yet. Maybe we could turn this into something. That being said, they're going to get absolutely ass pounded by us. Yeah. And, and Wisconsin, they could finish the season 10 and two, and we would still have a better record than them. We would still finish second in the big 10 behind them. So, because they would lose to Wisconsin and Iowa, and if they had two losses, we had two losses, we'd hold the tiebreaker over them. Uh, Minnesota is going to have four losses. Are we still talking about the Gophers? Sorry. Yeah, go yeah I don't know it. why we are Dude. still. This, How four losses. Happen? Four <laughs> losses. Easy four losses. Um, so, uh, anybody else got anything else they want to talk about on this Michigan game? No. Next. Flush um, it. I would just... I don't know. We kind of brushed over the defense real quick. We somehow went from talking about Iowa's defense into getting an, onto a tangent about Minnesota. I'm not really <laughs> sure how that happened. Um, but, yeah, I, you know, we did say it. Iowa's defense was incredible. And let's be honest, outside of that one 50-yard pass play that was defended pretty well, it was just a good catch, Michigan's offense didn't do squat all year long. So, yeah. Uh, I think that you know, in Michigan's offense has not been good all season long, so they're not exactly a great limitist test. But Iowa has a legit top 15, top 10 defense in the country. And just think of how good the defense could be if Imani Hooker and Anthony Nelson had not left for the draft. They would be just 
stacked. Yeah, they would. It yeah. It would be a nuts situation. I have one more thing about this game as well. It's more of a gripe with a with a rule than anything. But that past Oliver Martin in the end zone that they called uncatchable and they didn't call a holding or anything. I think that the uncatchable rule is such bullshit. Because that's not that shouldn't be the point. Who cares? The other team still cheated. cheated. They did something mm-hmm. that they should not be allowed to do. Like they call block in the back that obviously aren't going to affect the play. It so was why, why so does... obvious too. And, like, yeah. I could and not, not believe call, that they not call football. If you're not going to call, if you're not calling a pass interference, you can call a holding. That doesn't have anything mm-hmm. to do with the uh, with the uncatchable. And it was it was holding. Yeah, and also, uncatchable is, like, a very subjective call because, like, each ref, it, there's no way that they know the athletic abilities of every single player out in the field. So who is you to say, well, I don't think that he could have caught it even though he got mugged, so I'm not going to throw a penalty. He is white, though, so. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, but he's that. Oliver Martin. But Oliver, uh, that, that would have been a lot closer. <laughs> like, Oliver Martin would have given it a run there. I don't think he would have caught it, but... He would have given it a nice. Uh, he would have gotten a lot closer. It wasn't I, so. Yeah, it wasn't so absurd to where it couldn't. Like it was so obviously not catchable. Is what? Yeah. 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 At, a, at a minimum, it should have been a defensive holding in, auto, in an automatic first down at what the Michigan two. It would two. have been. Yep. Yeah. Uh, our, um. So, some well, more food for thought. This is unimportant, kind of. But I also thought this. Why is a spike not intentional grounding? There's receivers in the area. Is there? Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, but he yeah, but he's obviously not making an attempt to throw it at any receiver. I yeah, well, when you throw I, the ball out of bounds, when you throw the ball away, you're not trying to throw it. Uh, to the receiver. Just, you're just throwing it in their we're direction. We're not having this talk right now. Yeah, I don't like this conversation. Uh, we're gonna get an ad well, to an ad from our sponsor here before we move on. Demer Oil, brought based, to you by best best uh, based out of Dubuque County. They got locations in Worthington, Monticello, and Holy Cross. Uh, it's officially getting cold here. It's supposed to be in the 40s this weekend for the Penn State game. So your house is going to need to stay so warm for the min- winter months. Make sure your LP tank's full. Uh, go to DemerOilInc.com. Uh, call 1-800-433-3835 and ask for Steve and Toby. Have them help you out this winter months. Uh, we're going to move on now to... <laughs> <laughs> we're going to move on now to the Penn State game. Uh, refresh here a little Let's bit. Go! Let's start this week over. This is still a really, really big game because, as I mentioned, Iowa still holds the fate in, of the Big Ten West in their hands, whether people want to hear that or not. So we're just going to start this conversation off by what's your favorite Penn State memory? Uh, Adrian Claiborne. Blocked, scooped up. This is going to be a Hawkeye touchdown. <laughs> yes. I'll have to agree with Sam mid there. Yep. Uh also agreeing there, the Adrian Claiborne block punt. I, th- I think a funny part of that player, just that whole night that people forget about, it was like pouring down rain that day. And then Joe Paterno, old as shit, was just like standing on the sideline looking depressed while his glasses were just like completely covered in rain and sort of fogged up. That was That's like one of the visuals from that game that's always stuck with me, that's always cracked me up a lot. I Did he was... die like three weeks later? <laughs> no. I think it was a bit after that. When the whole, I think uh, it was a... Uh, yeah, get <laughs> so I uh I have a different favorite play. It's the from the year before. Daniel Murray whipped it out on national TV on ABC, game winning walk off field goal against number three undefeated Penn State, nine and oh. Coming into Kinnick Not Stadium. Ringing any bells. Yeah, right. <laughs> Not ringing. That was kind out of, of all of uh, our game winning kicks ever, that was the most pure. It was. Well it like, was like right on the money. It, the most like no has no question about it, it's gonna be good. Well, and there was so um, much that went into that. Like, so we were not having our best season, but uh, uh, that was kind of the beginning of the turnaround for the Hawkeyes because in like two thousand seven, six and seven, we weren't very good at all. And then that year, uh, we we were up and down. I think we were like that was our sixth win of the season. I think we were like six. We and went three. nine and four. Yeah, to no, be South I, Carolina. No, I'm saying we. I think we started the season six and three, and then we beat Penn State on the walk off there and we had two kickers actually i'm not sure if you remember that and it was kind of a crap shoot of which one we were going to send out ryan donahue or daniel murray and donahue is never a kicker that's the well i don't remember who it was then we absolutely had two kickers that year that were kind of fighting for the role and murray got got the nod but like uh the pen uh tyler sash had a key interception late in that game 
uh, off of who was the quarterback? God, that's going to bother me. Uh, Daryl Daryl Clark. Yes, and, Christian Hackenberg. Yeah, no, Daryl Clark. That's who it was. <laughs> Tyler Sash picked it off. Uh, Sean Green. Uh, we were down by like nine or ten late in the game, and Sean Green had a rushing touchdown to trim it down a little bit. And then, yeah, I just seeing Stanzi and his luscious locks on the sideline jumping up and down before the kick. And then Brett, Brett Trent Mus- Mossbrucker was the other kicker. There we go. And then uh, Brent Musburger on the call. It's just that's that's probably a top five Iowa moment for me. So yeah, I, I I'll never forget that uh, night. An honorable mention for favorite play for Iowa against Penn State is uh, that Akram Wadley catch and run touchdown late in the oh. game two years ago that gave us the lead. That was electric. The pick, the picture that. Uh, <laughs> web centric Dennis has of that with the entire with him diving over the end zone and the entire crowd with their arms up in the air. Oh yeah. It's, oh uh, buddy. What if we what won that, that game, that's a top five pick ever. What, what about that one against Penn State last year where um Stanley overthrew Hawkinson by like thirty yards? <laughs> I think we talked about that the last three podcasts. Honestly that that's the play that sticks out the most to me against Penn State. <laughs> the most wide open receiver in the history of Guys, football, come on. and he missed we're, it we're by ten yards. Zone it back in. We positive need... things like like Penn State beat Pitt by seven and Pitt outgained them. Let's talk about stuff like that. Like Penn State's it, so dominant, but they've literally played nobody. Yeah. So and Pitt, and Pitt has awful jerseys. <laughs> They're not good. Yeah. So uh, what 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 do you guys think about this game? I don't really know a whole lot about this Penn State team. Uh, in the past, I just hated Nick Sorrell a lot, and that was kind of what I rode. But you prerequisite to play quarterback at Penn State University is you have to be a giant douchebag. Uh, <laughs> I I've read I I haven't want really watched them, but their defense is pretty salty. But their quarterback is uh, kind of got a little uh, Tommy arm punt in him, I think. <laughs> so I think that yeah but yeah our defense I'm will keep gonna... us in the game against anybody. So yeah. I'm not going to lie, I kind of had just written off Penn State coming into the season after losing both their starting quarterback and running back, Uh, so I just didn't really give them much credit coming into the year, but obviously they've played well. I still don't think, I think that that we will win. Um, Iowa coming off that bad Michigan game, coming home, it's a revenge game, night game, nationally televised, we're striping the stadium. ABC! Yeah. Not a chance in hell Iowa loses this game. You guys already know. I'll put it on the board one more time. Iowa wins 210 to 0. That's And uh, just the other day was the anniversary of the biggest blowout in college football history when Georgia Tech beat Cumberland 222 to nothing. So you not pronounce Cumberland. I'm not I'm not, <laughs> not saying it's going to happen. Cumberland. Maybe history will repeat itself. Uh yeah, I I'm there's so many factors working in favor of the Hawkeyes in this game between night game and Kinnick coming off a loss where the offense got embarrassed. Uh, we're going to have, it's going to be big because we need to show. So Johnson. We, yeah, we're going to have some big time recruits for both football and basketball at this game. So we're going to have to show them a good weekend. Yeah. We got Xavier Foster and Theo, like he said. So we're, we're, we're going to have to show up and show out if, if if we want to land some of yeah. these recruits and show them a good let's, time, let's just say Sean Byer and Nate Whitting are going to have career days. If Theo Johnson's <laughs> going to, so they each need two. Nate, catches. I don't care what the heck you have to do. You throw them the ball, even their triple cover. You hear me, young man? <laughs> Brian Ferentz sounds like. Um, yeah, you know, for as bad as Brian Ferentz called last week's game, like when he's when he calls a bad game, it's absolutely garbage. But when he calls a good game, he's on. I think he's going to call a great game this week against Penn State. I think we're going to see some trickery. Mm-hmm. Man, I ho- Iowa hasn't tried anything so far this year. Tristan Wirfs is going to throw a touchdown pass. <laughs> oh, right to, <laughs> <it down. laughs> to who? Is he going to let her fly downfield or just hit somebody on a slip? To Larry Jackson. To yeah, no, Larry Jackson. <laughs> Jackson's going to put on gonna a lot of injuries. A lot of injuries. <laughs> yeah, hopefully there's no injuries. Uh, would you like to put out a score prediction for the game? I think it's going to be more offense than people think. Just because. So I'm going to go 13 to 10. <laughs> <laughs> Keith Big Balls Duncan. Game winner. Nah, I don't think we're going to have a walk-off kick, but that'd be kind of cool. 
wouldn't mind storming the field. Yeah. I'd be all right with that. Especially since Penn State's now a top 10 team. Joey, how about your score projection? Give me 2017. Iowa. Good year, too. Co- cover two, four and a half points. We're, we're giving Penn State four and a half points at home. I mean, if I had a mortgage or any money at all, I'm slamming that bad boy down. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. I think uh, the line has actually moved uh, like up for Penn State since it initially came out. A lot of the bets were coming in. Yeah, a lot of the money was going Iowa. to yeah, a lot of the money was going to Penn State. Let's see if we can... But uh, I'll I I agree with you, Sam. I think there will be more offense. I think we'll focus a lot on the offense this week, and the defense might struggle a little because of that. So I'll go thirty to twenty four Iowa. It's three and a half now. Can we talk about how uh, Tampa Bay won ninety six games in the MLB? What? Yeah, they're good. I they got they were pitching. terrible. Is Evan Longoria just killing it or something? <laughs> <laughs> he plays for the Giants. And Chris Archer's just throwing gems out there. That's nice. Yeah. yeah. No, they um their stadium's a dump, but their team is good and their fans suck. Yeah, it, they, it's, they they're selling these games out, right? I, I couldn't. Play. I know there was important games down the stretch of the regular season where they had like seven thousand people in attendance. All right, mm-hmm. we're not, we're I, not, saw that. I was just going to say they're up four nothing in bottom five right we're, now. We're we're not a Tampa Bay Rays podcast, so okay. Well, I, I might be jumping on that so. wagon. Uh, um, the, the, all aboard! The the spread. Was, on, both of the. You go, Austin. <laughs> you go, Austin. Damn it, Luke! I'm trying to talk about baseball on our Iowa Hawkeyes podcast. Would you let me? Um, I was going to say both of the AL wildcard teams this year were two teams where you're like don't know anything about just assume that they suck but then they ended up winning 90 games like that yeah and like they, what? they also both desperately want to get out of their city <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. yeah uh this i just looked up the spread on the penn state iowa game it's minus three and a half and the over under is 41 you said that oh you did no well i thought we were talking yeah. about since it moved smash the under smash the under on that too the under 41 points you're telling me that they're going to score more a higher score than 21-20? Heck no. Saquon Barkley isn't playing. Thank goodness also. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> you remember that game a couple years ago, the night game? Do you know we had, they had 600 yards and we only had 200, and they beat us on a last-second play? Did they really? They had 600 yards. Holy. Barkley had like 598 of them. That, oh. That's the absolute definition of an Iowa bend-don't-break defense. Where's that? Ru- that reminded me a lot of where does that rank on your all-time heartbreak losses for Iowa? Because one, un- oh, number Joey, the Big Ten championship game in 2015. Come on, that was pretty brutal. That nine and a half minute drive or, to suck our souls out. Or Ohio State in 2009. There's, I mean, it, I'm not saying it's not top five, but it's not number one. That's absurd. I don't know. It was pretty brutal. The, the atmosphere that night was absolutely electric. And then when it got down to where it was first and ten or first and goal from you know wherever, and the whole Iowa student section is like, we're gonna win this game. We're gonna storm the field. So everybody like started piling forward towards the barrier and like stacking up. And then we lost. And you could have heard a freaking pin drop in that place. Yeah, that was the best I'd ever seen, Kinnick. But uh, we when Wadley got in the end zone to give the Hawks the lead with like. Around two minutes to play, I was like, "Oh no, there is way too much time left in this game <laughs> yeah. right now." It was. It's I'm, that's it, Iowa did something that game which I've never understood for any team. They get a lead with like less than two minutes left in the game, or like less than a minute left in a game, where you know that the other team has to score a touchdown to win. And then you just start playing prevent defense because you don't want to give up that long ball over the top. But when you go in to prevent, you're basically saying take 10 or 15 yards across the middle every single play. And then, you know, six plays later, they're knocking on your doorstep anyway. I've always been an advocate for just play the same defense that you've been playing all day long and trust that your players aren't going to make a mistake and give up a 60-yard touchdown pass. Uh, Hey, Sam, we were just talking about where the Penn State game from 2006 2017 ranks in the all-time heartbreaks for Iowa. Oh, that's exciting. Um, <laughs> oh, man. Joey said number one, and I said that's crazy because Michigan no. Michigan State in 2015 and Ohio State in 2009 should be one, too. 
I put it above Ohio State for sure. Oh yeah, Michigan State. You know, honestly, yeah. I think I felt worse after the Penn State game than I did Michigan State game, though, because I feel like we deserved to win that game, and we didn't really deserve to win the Penn State game or the Michigan State game. Michigan. I don't know why. Yeah. I don't. Know. Wow. Yeah, that's tough. Mm-hmm. Also, Pro- after- probably against Tennessee. That's probably number one. <laughs> and <tax later>. well, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that did suck. Shout uh, out Jonathan Parker. Um, <laughs> after the Michigan State game. Obviously, it sucked because had Iowa won, you knew that they were going to play in the playoff. But then also, there was just the piece in the back of your mind that's like, Iowa's going to play Alabama if they win and get shit stomped. Even yeah, though we, we still Stanford went and got shit. Stomped. Yeah, I know. So it, it's not it's not like it made it any better. But like going into the game against Stanford, I was, I thought, I think that we have a decent chance of winning this game. Had we gone into a game against Alabama, I would have thought the entire time we're going to lose by forty five points. So. Like, don't get me wrong, losing that game sucked, but I think there was kind of like that just sitting in the back of my mind that made it not suck so terrible. Seeing Christian McCaffrey just absolutely torch guys in the NFL makes me feel a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Think about some of the running backs we've played. Saquon, David Johnson, and Christian McCaffrey. That's absurd. Yeah. Yeah. David David Montgomery, too. Oh, wait, no, he had like 30 yards. Never mind. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, and he and he's tearing it up with the underwhelming Chicago Bears right now. So, yeah. Uh, all right, we're gonna hit another ad from our sponsor here before we get to our final two segments in the show. Uh, looking to add your logo to your new business apparel or uniform for your business? Contact Brian Myers at Safeguard Eastern Iowa today. Safeguard is one of the largest providers of promotional products and branded apparel in the U.S. and carries all the top brands of clothing. Safeguard can have your logo applied using the perfect technique to make your logo stand out. Shirts, hats, jackets, uniforms, and scrubs just scratch the surface of what Safeguard can source for you. Call Brian Myers at 815-535-6840, and he'll help you find the item that's exactly what you're looking for. All right, now we're going to get to our... Safeguard repair, Safeguard safeguard replace. (laughs) That's not it. Uh, Now we're going to get to our Urban Dictionary read with Joey Myers. So, Joey, what do you got? What do I got? Well, quite honestly, uh, trying to come up with Penn State jokes is like shooting fish in, fish in a barrel. But uh, <laughs> many, of, many of them revolve around a touchy subject, and I don't want anyone else at Penn State to get butt hurt. So touchy I went with some of the milder <laughs> ones. Wow, you're just freezing right now so hard. <laughs> yeah. So I went with some of the milder ones. Um, Penn State, the place where three-fourths of the population have a passion for penis. Fans talk so much shit, and when they lose, they cry and blame it on anyone else but their own pathetic, shitty sports team. Overall, Penn State and their fans are complete garbage. Um, <clears throat> Penn State. Located in what almost qualifies as a real town in central Pennsylvania, Penn State doubles the population of State College for eight months each year. Mostly a college for people that weigh more than their IQs, this state school promises a degree at least a third of UPenn's and half of Lafayette's. Nevertheless, no party in the state is bigger than Penn State. So if you're looking for a, a week full of drunk, this is your place to go. If you're looking for a real education, maybe you should look elsewhere. And then we have Penn State. One, a college very much like four extra grades of high school located in central Pennsylvania. <laughs> Two, the largest congregation of cattle and rednecks east of the Mississippi. <laughs> and three, the only school on earth where do you want fries with that is a major. <laughs> And that's all we have. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Yeah, like like you said, the Penn State <laughs> jokes are easy to come by, uh, but appreciate you doing it anyways. <laughs> and there was a lot that I cannot say on the air. Yeah, good call, good call. Joey yep. would have caught a probation if he would have read those on the air. Uh, all mm-hmm. right, now we'll get to our final segment, and that's Thoughts from Space with Space Cowboy. <laughs> all right, this week's. Thoughts from space. Michigan game thoughts. Fucking classic Iowa. Defense steps up and offense makes no adjustments. I put most blame on Brian Ferens, but Stanley has started enough games and now has enough weapons to spot some of those blitzes. Throw a screen, some quick slants, something to mix it up. Also, running the ball out of shotgun was not working, but keep beating a dead horse. Bright side. 
take away a turnover and a deep play for Michigan, and that game goes to overtime. Should have won, could have won, but didn't. Now it's time to see how they recover. If they win, I think 10 wins is very possible. If they drop the ball to Penn State, then this isn't the team that I thought it was. Confidence level in Stanley. Average. Like his play. Unless it's a road game, then it's below average. Like Stin's penis size. (laughs) Defense should get better when Hankins and Reef return, which is scary for everyone but Wisconsin, who will butt fuck us. Favorite Penn State memory. Claiborne blocked punt, but just by a hair. Final thoughts. If you twats talk about the Penn State game from two years ago, I will close my garage, (laughs) stuff a sock in my muffler, and not listen this week. Let it die. The AL Central is the worst division in baseball. Serial killers buy crackers, which are actually vegetables, such as cauliflower-based snacks. You don't actually like it. Buy some Cheez-Its, you psychopaths. Finally, AB Comeback of the Week goes to Adrian Martinez. Heard she got hurt this week in Nebraska, so I'm sure she will do a great job of cleaning Scott Frost's belly button fuzz until the cramps go away and the bleeding stops. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Oh boy. Uh, I didn't see, how did Nebraska fare this weekend? Oh, okay. They got so freaking lucky. There was Northwestern was driving in the last, like, two minutes, two and a half minutes left. Obvious pass interference call. Nothing. Huskers get the ball back, march down the field, kick a field goal and win. Seriously, Nebraska and Northwestern might not score on us. Like, actually. Yeah, no, I agree. I'm, Yeah, we, we held Michigan to 10 points, so why would Nebraska score on us? Well, Wisconsin held Michigan to zero points, so... Or seven. Yeah, seven. Wisconsin's better. Actually, wasn't it 14? Didn't they get two garbage time timeouts? Touchdowns. Or... <laughs> two garbage Bastards. time timeouts, huh? Yeah. I hate when that happens. It's, Isn't that the worst? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right. Do you guys have anything else you want to touch on, or we'll wrap it up here? Yeah, I have one thing. Do you guys see the uh, moon landing Purdue uniforms that they just released? Yeah, those th- things are freaking sweet. Those are icy for sure. Purdue doesn't do a lot right, but they're pretty solid with their jersey game. Uh, I love their all blackout uniforms with the railroad track going down the middle of their helmet. That's one of my personal favorites in college football. So. Yeah, those are pretty cool uh, uniforms. Since you see UCF is kind of throwing a bitch fit that Purdue is stealing oh my. the idea. I had a yeah, little sympathy wow. for UCF for like a little while there, but oh, they've gotten so annoying. I, I've never had sympathy for them. They've just been crybabies the entire time that claimed a national championship for no reason. And then they complained hard enough that the NCAA gave them a co-national championship, with this, which is just outrageous. I mean... Are we going to start giving out participation trophies in college football, too? It's, uh, I UCF irritates me. I'm happy that they've lost a couple games this year so they can stop talking about how they're you know, deserving of it being in the national championship conversation and how, what are they in, the AAC? That, about, that's the, the power sixth conference. The it's all-time not. troll job by Cincinnati football Twitter. Yeah, that was cool. That was epic. Yeah. Did but, you guys see that, duh. Austin Joey? Mm-mm. Negative. Go look at Cincinnati's football. T- oh, I'll just send it to you guys. <laughs> All right, but we're oh, gonna... you another have... Cincinnati football thing. Now that we're talking about it, how disappointing is it that they didn't do actually do that field? Yeah, that's real depressing. Oh wait, they yeah. didn't. No, they didn't. no. It was their official football account that tweeted that out. It was going to be the coolest field of all time, and they actually didn't do it. They're like, ha! It was just a joke. That was bullshit. Yeah. No balls. All right. We're going to wrap up the podcast here with kind of a with a really sad note. Uh, former Iowa running back Derek Mitchell was involved in a car crash over the weekend and passed away. Very young. He was one of, one of the four horsemen of the 2015 running back field for the Hawkeyes. Him, LaShawn Daniels, Akram Wadley, and Jordan Kanziri. Uh Just passed away from the car accident, and you hate to see that. A lot of, a lot of sad Iowa players out there right now because – Obviously, they were close friends with him. Anybody got any notes here? Rest in peace. Yeah, just sad. Him and Damon Bullock within like a year. Mm-hmm. Super sad. Yeah, it's just a shitty situation there. But we're going to wrap up another episode of the Hawkeye Tailgate Report. Uh, follow us on Twitter uh, at go underscore Hawks Iowa is the show's Twitter. My Twitter is Myers underscore Luke. 
Joey's is at Joe Mama two one nine six. Austin's is Myers Austin, and Sam Middleton's is at S A M M M I D D. Uh, also, my Venmo. No, uh, I'll, uh, also go subscribe to the show on iTunes and Podbean. Leave a review for us. We'd love to hear back from you. If you have an idea for a segment, let us know, and we'll try and make it happen. Uh, let's go get a Penn State victory this weekend. We need a win, need a bounce back, and as always, go Hawks. <laughs>